G'day, I'm Kitty of the Hobart Dolls Hospital. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Uh, and today, uh, my video will be about restoring a teddy bear. Don't forget to like and subscribe. There'll be more and more videos coming out as I progress through the many requests I've been receiving. So please don't hesitate to get in touch and let me know what you would like to see on the Hobart Dolls Hospital YouTube channel. So today I have a lovely little teddy bear. He's an Australian Burlex teddy bear. Now the Burlex teddy bear played an important, pretty important role in Australia's history of toys. He was made in Melbourne and he's a lovely example. He needs a little bit of work, a bit of a tidying up. He's had lots of love, lots of hugs. How do we know he's a burlex teddy bear? Very easy to spot a burlex teddy. They're made from a very high quality mohair. I believe some of this mohair may have come from Merrythought in England and also some German mohair. It is very, very high quality, very thick and very lush to feel, very nice indeed. The nose, it's a little embroidered triangular shaped nose. And the Burlex Teddy also has the funny little downward facing mouth. And yet the funny thing is, I don't think he looks grumpy. Mouths that go down at the side often look grumpy, but I don't think he does. He also has the lovely little glass eyes. Now the Burlex Teddy's eyes were clear, uh, clear glass and then painted at the back. Now these eyes um, were often done like this in England. England also made the amber glass eyes, but they also produced eyes that were painted on the back. They often had like a brown coloured paint on the back. And sometimes this paint can start coming off. Uh, but you can restore that if you wish to. This poor little man, his eye, his left eye, has broken in half. Luckily, I collect teddy bear eyes, even the odd ones. And so I may well have an eye that matches the remaining glass eye. However, if it doesn't match exactly, then I'll replace both. The thing is, these glass eyes were often hand blown, so they're not always exactly the same size. The pupil isn't always exactly the same size. And so um, sometimes you need to replace both eyes so the pupils match, or in the case of ones where the glass has been colored amber, so that that amber color matches in each eye. So sometimes you've got to fiddle around a little bit match the eyes up. He is generally in very good condition. The other thing that um, burlex bears have is the vinyl paw pads. And also this particular model, this is like a 1950s model, there's the neck isn't articulated. There, there's no joint in the neck, so the head can't turn side to side. Arms and legs can, but the neck can't. When you repair a teddy, it's important not only to consider are you reducing its value if you're working on a teddy that is old or, or is worth a lot of money, but besides that, besides monetary value, you've also got to look at the personality of the teddy. Don't remove that personality. If you change it too much, the person who grew up with that teddy loses their teddy. So maintain its personality and its character. And this may mean that some things, some of the damage may need to be left because some of that damage tells a story. So we need to look at this teddy carefully. His arms, I presume it's a boy. It's hard to tell with teddies. His arms need extra filling. The legs as well. The joints are pretty good. Burlex joints tend to be quite good in the teddies. Now there's quite a few different joints. Um, 
The way the burlex teddy joints were done, they do tend to stay in place quite well. They tend not to loosen. Now, in, in examining the bear, the other thing to consider is, does it have a voice box? It's not working, but if you have a feel, you'll soon, usually you will soon find if it has a voice box or really what you call a growler in teddies. This one did have a growler. Some will have a squeeze growler where you press them. Some will have uh, a growler where you rock them, which is a growler like this. The Dolls Hospital get their growlers from Sonnenberg in Germany, and it's a family that's been making these growlers for a long, long time. And there's different sizes. And because the sound is made by a little reed inside, even growlers of exactly the same size may sound a tiny little bit different because the reed is just fractionally different because the reed's been put together by hand. So if, if you are trying to create a sound that you remember your teddy used to have, you may need to have to listen to a few growlers until you find the perfect sound. And the growler will sit that way so the bear can rock that way and make the sound. So it fits up and down. One of the commonest problems with the old growlers is that they, they, uh, the old ones were often made of cardboard and it just falls apart. Some go rusty, a bit of moisture's got in there. Another problem is that pieces of the filling that's inside the teddy has gone inside the growler. So you may actually be able to resurrect the original growler if you give it a really good clean. Another problem that can happen is because some of the very old growlers have like a bellows inside, those bellows can perish. So what I need to do is open up Teddy and get the old growler out. Most torsos on Teddy bears have their final stitching along the back, very occasionally at the front. But this one you can see is along the back so I will open it and I'll take my glasses off for this some work I see better without my glasses on but then I'll pop them back on so I can see you again okay so very very carefully because it's, it's made from old fabric you don't want to cause any holes that will then spread and become bigger and compromise the edge of the fabric where, where you want to stitch it back up. So open it very, very carefully. This teddy has what is called wood wool inside. Some people think it's straw, but it's not. It's actually, it's like very fine wood shavings that looks like straw, but it's not straw. Um, it does mean um, teddies, some teddies can be quite hard and solid because of this stuff that's packed in so tightly. When you open up teddy, at the same time, check for any signs of infestation. Infestation normally occurs in teddies that are made out of leather, sheep skin and so on. Um, so I get it a lot in uh, some of the uh, leather koala bears and the sheepskin teddies that were made in Australia. If you do find that there's any sign of infestation, the best thing to do is quadruple bag teddy first. The reason why, why I say four is there's, you're going to put teddy in the freezer and you do not want any moisture to get inside that bag, particularly if it is real leather. But even with these, you don't, want ex you don't want any moisture to get in the bag. Then you put Teddy in the freezer for four weeks. And that will ensure that not only does any infestation uh, die off, but also if there's any eggs in there, those eggs will die off as well. They won't survive the cold. So um, Teddy's made out of leather. 
have a look. Sometimes you'll see little tiny holes or they might be getting ball patches or you might actually see the, the dirt or the poo from the insects that are infesting the teddy. So it can be quite easy to spot. So I've almost opened teddy enough. Take my glasses off again. And I'm now going to have a look at this grailer. So I pull out some of the wood wool. This can get a little bit messy. If it's a very old teddy, they might this this filling might be, be very dusty. And if that happens, I suggest wearing a mask. Because you don't know, particularly in the really old ones, what's in that dust. And here is the old growler. Usually the, the bigger the growler, the lower pitch the sound. Uh, the other thing too is you can pull it apart and get the little reed out and blow through the reed and that'll give you an idea of the type of sound that Teddy would have originally made as well. So we've pulled out some of this wood wool. I'm going to go for the small one. Now I said earlier that one of the problems you can have with growlers is um, filling that that's in the teddy actually gets inside the holes. So one of the things you can do is pull out a bit more of the wood wool and line the cavity with a filling that you know will not get inside. One of the things I often do is um, buy pillows, um, bed pillows um, from, from Spotlight, any of the bedding and linen suppliers, and I buy the ones that actually have the hypoallergenic filling. That way I'm not introducing anything into Teddy that, that a child or an adult might be sensitive to. I also keep this in mind if I have a teddy that they want total new filling in. I pull all the old filling out and then I replace it with hypoallergenic filling. So I line the cavity. and insert the growler into the cavity and then put the filling around the side and the top of the growler. This filling is going to prevent any of the original filling from getting inside the growler. I've also, um, our doll specialist, Lorraine, I've seen her actually put um, cries, the doll criers, into a little bag before she pops them inside the doll. That's another way of keeping the filling away from the holes. And then as you stitch up Teddy, You, it closes up the areas and creates spots where you can pack the filling in quite firmly. Make a really good knot because this sort of fabric, small knots can easily pull through. You want to make sure that it's anchored well. I often find when stitching up these types of seams is start from the more obvious spot and finish at the less obvious spot so that when you not when you do that final knot it's not as obvious also sometimes with really old teddies with the way the fabric stretches it can be very hard to get that area that's been brought together exactly even it's far better to have a little bit that's not quite right at the bottom than somewhere else further to the top. So start at the most obvious spot and finish at the least obvious spot. And I apply that to every part of the teddy that I work on.
The stitch I use is I go down one side come across to the other side exactly opposite where the stitches come up on there come across go in and come up and when you do this and bring it in nice and tight you find the stitching is becomes virtually invisible some of the old cotton is still there so I'm going to get that out of the way if the fabric is very fragile and you find it's fraying as you stitch, use a fine needle. It, it damages the fabric less as you do this. Another alternative is to actually stitch fabric along the edge of the fraying fabric first. So put the fabric underneath some additional fabric, stitch it into place to reinforce it. Sometimes when you're pulling it in tight, when you're using a double thread, you might need to separate the thread, pull a little bit on each thread, and that'll pull it in tight. Now there's a little bit of space in there still, so I'll use my well-used, trusty artery forceps. You've got to put it in fairly tight because, like I said earlier, the wood wool is very, very hard. And you don't want, and, and this is very, very soft. So you don't want too big a difference between the hard spots and the, so, and the, and the soft spots. So you, you've really got to pack this stuff in very well in order to give his body that sort of balanced feel. But while doing this, keep in mind that some areas of the fabric could be quite fragile could easily tear so you're all the time checking the original seams and any other spots just to make sure that you're not creating damage by packing Teddy too tightly now you've got to make sure that this is knotted well and so it doesn't come undone there's a lot of tension in that seam and if you don't do it properly it will over time come undone so spend a bit of time put a bit of effort into finishing off that final bit to make sure that it all stays firmly done and then cut off so his back is now done and he's got his voice now his arm the, exterior wise it is in lovely condition but it needs more filling so I'm going to go back here and look for a seam See if I can see a spot where I can easily see the stitching, where there's just a little bit of give and the stitching is quite obvious. So I can get at it and with my trusty stitch on picker, very carefully cut that first stitch. Can be hard to do that very first one once you've done it. Everything else just is so much easier. And only make the hole just big enough to squeeze some filling in. I will have to show you on another video how to repair uh, the joints on the teddies. This one's joints are too, too good a condition to pull apart. They are fine as they are. The old Burlex teddy bear joints. Another common problem I have is some of the beautiful, well-made teddies that have a weakness, and the weakness being plastic joints. Beautiful teddies. The trouble with the plastic 
uh, joints is they can crack and break. So I think that might be just about enough. I've only just made a hole just big enough. I won't use that bit. I'll use some more out of my pillow that I purchased. I've had some really old teddy bears where their joints are actually made out of pieces of tin that have been cut and into circles. The trouble with, um, if you imagine this was a piece of tin that's been cut around, some of the edges can be very sharp and they'll gradually work their way through the fabric of the teddy bear. And also if they're made out of a metal that rusts easily, sometimes they start rusting. So that's another thing to check when you're restoring an old teddy. Now I'm not going to stitch this one and then unstitch the other arm and fill that one. Leave them both unstitched so that you can have a feel of them as you're filling, as you're filling them, the other arm. You can feel them and make sure they both match. Hi. Uh, I don't have a superpower as a quick change artist. I've actually um, had a break from teddy repairing and this is the next day. So different clothes, slightly different light, still the same me, still the same teddy. I've gone through my collection of odds and ends, little spare eyes and things, and I found an eye that pretty close to the original to the point where you really can't see the difference. So I'd say this eye has come off the burlic spear. So it's worthwhile being a hoarder because what you collect, you can find that you can use later. I'm just gonna check the eye that we're going to leave attached just to make sure it is in there firm. And I'm actually going to use the German method of um, attaching the eye. The Germans in their toy production I think in many ways were ahead of their times when it comes to safety. They really made sure that those eyes were not going to come off. Because it's an old eye I don't want to bend or muck around with that wire too much because the more you bend it, the weaker it gets. So fiddle around with that wire the least amount as possible or you're gonna end up snapping the wire off. Now with eyes, you do not want them to come off, particularly glass eyes. They can be quite a hazard. So I recommend having your cotton that you use. I use the, a very, very strong uh, embroidery cotton. It takes a lot to break that. But even so, I'm going to double it. sure we get all the knots out. It's not going to go through if it's got a knot in it. So it's doubled. I use a long needle, poke it through. So you actually end up having it quadrupled. You've got four strands there. So a seam there and a seam there, poke it in around the seam towards the base of the neck, not right in the seam or it might actually pull through the, the stitching at some point and you don't want that to happen. And then have a fiddle until you get the needle through that spot where the eye is going to go. Right. 
and then pull it through but leave a bit out hanging out the back now just double check that it is in the right spot yep I still think that's pretty right if you tie it all into place and then feel that it's in the wrong spot don't be afraid to redo it now even though I've said don't fiddle with the wire too much I am going to bend it just a little bit so that it will that that little bit of wire I've bent it in will sit down into that hole so the eye will fit nice and flush to the surface of the head and then back in through the same hole that's important the same hole that you've come out through with a needle poke the needle back in there sorry Teddy and then you come out through the back not through the same hole in the back but through a spot near the hole Pull the eye into place, double check that it is looking even, and it is. Now you can change a lot of the uh, personality of a teddy by how tight you pull the eyes in. The tighter the eyes, the more shapely the face, and you can end up with different expressions. So as we're leaving the original eye in there, we're just going to make sure that we bring that eye in the same tension as the existing eye. Cut off the cotton and then tie it into place. And tie it well too. Make sure it is a good knot. Just double check that eye is the same. Yep. A nice strong knot cut it off close to the knot not right at the knot a little bit away from it because you don't want it to come undone so Teddy is looking better and better very good now we need to look at his nose I've got three types of black here Again, another excuse to hoard. Old cottons and vintage cottons and antique cottons are good to have because they've got that old look. With some teddies, if they've been really well loved over the years, you don't want to give it a nose that looks like a new nose because it's going to stand out like a sore thumb. You want to use a cotton that reflects the age and the history of the teddy. That way you're not taking away its personality. So I am going to use this one. This is a, a fairly old cotton. It's not quite as black as what it used to be. I will now just trim any loose bits that are sticking up that as I, as I embroider, I don't want all those little bits coming out. Now is the time, if you want to put some extra stuffing in there, do it. But I'd recommend opening Teddy at either the neck or the back of the head in order to access that area. And then using a long pair of forceps to force the filling into place. But I'm going to leave that face as it is. I think his face is gorgeous. Doesn't need changing. So I have this cotton that I've chosen and another thing I've found too is the more fragile a fabric, the thinner the needle you should use. If the, fra if the fabric is quite fragile and it's fraying and there's little holes in it, if you use a big thick needle you cause further damage and further fraying. This, this fabric is in very good condition but I'm still going for a reasonably thin needle for this sort of job. Sometimes in the past I have been tempted to do a nose with a double thread. 
You think, yeah, that's right, it's thick. You fill the nose in quickly. However, when you use a double thread, it can be very difficult to have the same tension on each thread. So as you pull it into place, you may find that one of the threads loop up a little bit. It doesn't quite fit as firmly or sit as firmly as its other, fre other thread. So I suggest using one thread at a time rather than a double. In fact, it's far better, I think, far better finish if you use a, a single thick thread rather than a double thinner thread. Hope that makes sense. Some noses, it's easy to tie a knot in your, in your thread and hide the knot. I'll take my glasses off again so I can see. Um, but what I'm going to do is double stitch back until I anchor the thread into place. Every now and then stop and have a look at it front on. So you can, if there's any problems that's not, if any areas that aren't quite straight, if the stitching's not quite even, you'll pick up on that early and then you can undo your bit of stitching and redo it. Okay, so now for some final finishing. Um, these are vinyl pads. They're not too bad. Their condition is actually quite good, but I'd like to give them a clean, a little bit of a condition. I find WD-40 is quite good. Don't spray it on directly because you could end up staining the fabric. Spray a little bit on a piece of material and then very carefully rub it on. Just don't go to the edges where the fabric is. And that will remove quite a bit of dirt and condition the surface at the same time. The next thing I like to do is give them a little bit of a brush. I'll give it a brush in the reverse of the way the pile is laying and it just lifts the pile, lifts the fur, makes Teddy look as though he or she has put on a little bit of weight as well. It just makes them look a bit softer and a bit cuddlier. And any areas where you've stitched, carefully go over it with the comb or a brush, lifting the pile where the stitches are. Also, sometimes if you look carefully in old Teddy, you will find that there might be some areas where some fur has been stitched when it was originally made, stitched into the seam. So if Teddy is lacking in hair, you can actually bring those little bits up with a needle, lift, loop the, put the needle under the loop of the fur where it's stitched in and just lift it and the fur will, under, will come open um, and straighten out and um, make Teddy look as though he's sprouted some new hair. So I think Teddy is looking lovely, but ha, huh? Teddy is missing one final touch. I always send my Teddies home with a new ribbon around their neck. So I just do a simple bow. Bow ties are quite nice too. If you've got a, some little bow ties or you could make some bow ties. Bow ties always look wonderful on a Teddy. I've done some with the little tuxedos and then a bow tie. They look a bit James Bondish. I think that finishes off Teddy beautifully. Teddy will be ready to go home now. New nose, new eyes, or new eye, so his matching eyes. Clean paws, a nice brush. He's put on weight. I blame it on the Hobart Dolls Hospital food. All my patients tend to put on weight here. But I think he is looking gorgeous. Thank you for watching How to Restore a Teddy Bear.